Okay, so please welcome. This time we have another topic and I will give you a tutorial, an introduction to machine learning and neural networks and learning as a cognitive faculty or cognitive process is very central to humans but also to animals. So animals in general are able to adapt and survive in the world on the basis of being able to learn new things, to process novel situations, to solve problems. And it's also such a situation that the, uh, there are two kinds of modes of learning. So we learn at an evolutionary level, so as a kind of species, and then as humans we are very much learning at an individual level. So our capacity to learn is, is, is r uh, remarkable. And the motivation or the importance learn, uh, of learning comes from the possibility of learning to cope in novel situations, to solve uh, unseen problems and to build new knowledge. And as such, the motivation related to modeling comes from the fact that we really can't anticipate all the knowledge that we need in the future. So that's why we can't predict that what kind of situations we will encounter in the future and that's why learning is essentially essential and that also means that when we are crafting knowledge in computational form we really can't predict what happens in the future and what kind of models of the environment and situations we need, but we really need to have machine learning, some kind of uh, learning. Machine learning is not a novel thing at all, so it has been there for decades and in the 80s when we had a flourishing area of era of artificial intelligence, so it was typically such that people devised models where knowledge representations, rules, etc. were learned. And one of the classical works is given here where Carbonell and others uh, made a seminal work where they gave a distinction between different kinds of learning like rote learning which was just the idea that the machine learns whatever is kind of given to it so that it memorizes the events for example that it has experienced in some sense. And then there were others like that, like a teacher would be instructing the machine, so learning from instruction, learning from analogy, so the similarity of events or cases would be the basis of learning, but doesn't need to be exactly the same so that they can be similar events or similar cases. Then learning from examples comes close to the modern kind of uh, machine learning so that you have a number of examples and then you create generalizations or models based on those examples. And another kind of view into learning was on learning from observation and discovery. And the world is full of uh, the, the world is full of textbooks related to machine learning so there are many kinds of um, sources which can be used beneficially for uh, familiarizing oneself in this area and there are, uh, some of those are very theoretical like this Vladimir Wapnik's work on statistical learning theory which is one of the influential works, but it's also mathematically quite uh, requiring. Uh, Peter Novik is a central person at Google, Google Research Director, and the work on artificial intelligence and modern approach has been very influential textbook on this area. Uh, then a very good author is the one who has, who has written the book 
on machine learning, uh, Theodor Rikis, who is a Greek professor, but uh, nothing problematic there. He, he has written ex excellent textbooks related to machine, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, patent recognition, etc. Maybe here it's also worth mentioning that one of the uh, important scholars in this area is a connection between data mining and machine learning, and there one of the influential people has been Heikki Mannila, who is nowadays the director of Academy of Finland. Within artificial intelligence, it has been a debate on whether one should create this kind of models of human cognition then simulated by starting from theory of what, the, what are the problems like and how they should be solved, taking whatever mathematical, statistical, uh, reasoning related theory, or whether one should be following nature inspired path in developing these systems. Those who think that theory sh should be the starting point, they suggest that when one was creating learning uh, flying machines, so they were not like birds, so they were quite different, or at least substantially different from birds. Whereas it, the question is now again about analogy, so to which degree actually the analogy holds, so to which degree uh, airplanes are like birds and to which degree not. And are there, by the way, some innovations related to airplanes that are still missing so that this analogy could be taken further. One historical connection related to computer science, artificial intelligence, and then to philosophy is related to the idea of considering learning as induction. So learning as inductive inference, where the basic kind of categories there related to reasoning are deductive, abductive, and uh, inductive reasoning. And inductive reasoning is maybe the most common way of seeing uh, machine learning from this point of view. So the idea is that machines would be able to conduct some kind of generalizations. So that the in inductive reasoning refers to the idea of, of creating new knowledge, which doesn't ne is not necessarily valid, but it's based on the data and looking for generalizations. And interestingly, inductive reasoning is and has been a very popular topic also within Finnish uh, philosophical uh, work. So, for example, Jaakko Hintikka, Ilkka Niiniluoto and even Esa Saarinen have been working uh, intensively in this area during their careers. Jaakko Hintikka, I saw his presentation about a year ago and he was still very actively uh, conducting research related to his, these areas, but actually from the probabilistic point of view. One interesting question, interdisciplinary question, is that Chomsky uh, has launched this idea of poverty of stimulus, poverty of the stimulus, where the idea is that uh, one can't really learn grammar from data. So he has suggested that there has to be a process taking place in our uh, cognition, uh, in our brain, that is based on evolutionary principles rather than uh, individual learning so that the syntax really can't be learned from data. And that has been debated a lot uh, over the decades and that we can address soon a little bit more carefully. It has been also suggested uh, that learning is not possible before you really know a lot about the world and from the point of view of modeling things. So there was an influential or at least very large project called Psych, where a researcher called Douglas Lennart suggested for funding agencies that give me 50 million US dollars so I will give you artificial intelligence and, and then, then machines can also learn, etc. Uh, this wasn't very uh, successful it was a kind of encyclopedia and maybe a kind of early ontology, but it really failed to deliver all the things that 
the 50 million uh, dollars was kind of just suggested to give. But the basic idea there was that before learning one has to really kind of have something before that. Uh, but then if we consider then the other way, so the approach of taking uh, bio-inspired bio uh, approaches and specifically neural networks, the earliest uh, works and ideas, uh, influential works were from the 1940s where there were McCulloch uh, and uh, Pitts who were uh, who authored a paper where they suggested this kind of approach and another researcher, Donald Hepp, was then suggested that these kind of neural networks are functioning in such a way that when there are connections between two neurons in the brain, so the connection is strengthened when these uh, neurons are, are fired at the same time. And that basic idea has been applied then very heavily. Then I mentioned here also a kind of Finnish uh, connection because already in the 70s and late 60s Professor Kohonen was working in this area. So he was first working in physics but then he got inspired by the results related to neuroscience and he started to create models related to uh, neural networks, artificial neural networks and became very uh, well known in that area. If we think about machine learning and here neural networks, there are different kinds of paradigms or approaches. The first one mentioned here is supervised learning, where the idea is that you have some categories and you classify some items to those, classi uh, those categories. So in some sense you have some data that supervises the learning of the, uh, of the system. And in order to make it more efficient, there's this idea of semi-supervised learning. So the ba basic approach is still to categorize some items, like for example, if you had uh, linguistic data, you categorize the input into some, into some linguistic categories, like parts of speech, but then you have the theory of the content so that you need to have those categories. The other end is this unsupervised learning where you really don't need to assume any categories. You just have the data and you let the system to find patterns and connections, uh, main, main connections within the data. The uh, paradigm of reinforcement learning is quite different in some sense because it's often used, for example, in game uh, learning where the idea is that the end result of the behavior of that learning agent is such that it gives feedback of the success of that learning. So that it's, you don't have the answers, right answers, but the learning is not unsupervised because you get this kind of signal, kind of feedback that how well the system works. And that has also uh, particular uses related to cognitive modeling. But as mentioned, so we have this historical point of view that Professor Kohonen started work on neural network research already in the 70s. And when many researchers gave up that research, he still continued and became famous internationally in that area. And his major and best known result is the self-organizing map algorithm, which is then uh, the most popular still in the area of unsupervised learning. And this method was published already in 1982. And then there are, of course, a large number of different methods which are, for example, theoretically in some sense uh, maybe better grounded, but uh, the, the method in, in itself has still kept uh, much of its popularity. And the, um, as said, so the inspiration came from the fact that what was known from the cortical, about the cortical organization of human brain. And the uh, works by Kohonen uh, were published in various textbooks 
and then there are dozens or even hundreds of textbooks which are actually um, giving uh, giving different points of view into the theory and applications of the self-organizing map. Uh, actually, I wasn't aware of this until very recently. I learned to know from one Brazilian professor who was uh, trying to estimate and calculate the popularity of the self-organizing map among neural network models. Uh, I'm not sure about the quality of the uh, numbers which are here if they are uh, fully complete, but anyway, it seems that the self-organizing map could be still uh, the most popular neural network model. Uh, deep learning models are really gaining popularity very much nowadays, so this figure is definitely going to grow uh, substantially, but anyway, so we can be, from the Finnish point of view, we can be quite proud about the fact that we have such a such a historical landmark and also so a lot of research has been then being inspired and going to different directions. And for example there's this early work by Professor Erki Oja uh, on a related uh, area but then the method of independent component analysis has really taken a lot of ground in the world and especially Professor Aapo Hyverinen's work either on the methodology and for example applying on the on the processes related to visual, visual cognition. But let's uh, take a last comment on the poverty of the stimulus argument. And I would claim that Chomsky is in his work, uh, let's in one word, it, I would call it narrow. So first of all, he only considers syntax and syntax is of course only one part of linguistic processing and linguistic phenomena. And if one only takes syntax as a starting point on learning something, so the semantic and pragmatic aspects of, of uh, learning language wouldn't be dealt with, which is a kind of problematic assumption. On the other hand, the formal uh, framework that he takes also is problematic because the if one only considers language as a string of symbols, there, is, there are other things, contextual factors, which are not taken into account. And also when the poverty of the stimulus argument is being considered, it has been claimed that there is not enough feedback and that data itself doesn't provide enough basis for learning, learning things. But cognitive scientists and psychologists ha have pointed out that there is actually a lot of feedback uh, being kind of given to the early, in the early development of language so that it doesn't need to be explicit fa father or mother saying that this was incorrect or that you should use uh, this uh, tense or whatever. But the idea is that the child and baby already from the very kind of subtle, subtle uh, feedback actually understands that what what is kind of more correct than something else and especially from the point of view that one gets feedback by noticing that if one uh, is being understood or not so that if, if one is babbling in the beginning so there's not much understanding and the closer one gets to the uh, to the let's say understandable level of language use so then there is then there is a chance also to learn the uh, uh, appropriate categories, not assuming that they need to be evolutionary given already in our brains when we are born, like those who really strongly propo propose this poverty of the stimulus argument. And that means in practice that, for example, reinforcement learning could be actually very important from the point of view if one really wants to seriously model, model the early development of language at the cognitive level. And also this work on, on using self-organizing map, early work in 1995, already shows quite a bit of the fact that uh, much can be learned from the data, so that the linguistic categories without any, any kind of pre-theoretical uh, basis can, be, uh, given, uh, can give uh, rise to the representations that then are useful and coincide with the kind of theoretical understanding and human understanding of uh, linguistic categories. 
Thank you. This was a kind of warming up and introductory talk related to the kind of different aspects of uh, machine learning and neural network research.